So hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to deliver this talk. I'd especially like to thank uh, Guilherme Oliveira and Alexandre Aleixo for inviting me for this session. Uh, and today I'd like to tell you a bit about our projects on evolutionary and conservation genomics of wild carnivorans. Uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist based in Southern Brazil and I've been conducting projects on these species uh, for a couple of decades by now, but recently moving more and more towards genomics. My laboratory is focused on uh, genetics, genomics, evolution, ecology, and conservation of carnivores, especially although we do some work on other taxa as well. Most of our work is focused on this group. And we use the variety uh, of approaches uh, to study uh, evolution, ecology, um, and demographic history, among other things, of these species, um, including originally field ecology, phylogenetics, population genetics, uh, and other approaches mostly based on molecular markers, and more and more nowadays uh, going towards genomics to address some of these questions using the approaches outlined here in this slide. Uh, and looking at a problem such as speciation, introgression, um, hybridization among species, adaptive divergence, and population genetics uh, of different taxa. Um, our focus uh, is the order carnivora, uh, which is, uh, let me just put my pointer on again, which is a monophyletic group within the mammalia. This is a phylogeny of mammals, and here the carnivora are highlighted. Uh, it's a monophyletic group that comprises over 280 species, including some very well-known ones, such as cats, and dogs, uh, seals, bears, hyenas, and others. It has very high uh, functional diversity. It includes uh, very disparate sizes, for example, one of the largest size ranges among the mammals. Uh, marine species, uh, freshwater species, terrestrial species, arboreal species. So very diverse group of mammals. Some species have high profile uh, in terms of being charismatic, uh, megafauna species. Um, many are uh, of conservation concern due to habitat loss and various kinds of human wildlife conflict. So there are many aspects of these species that require attention and have uh, driven us to study them. Um, this is a phylogeny of the carnivora itself of the order in which we see 16 different families such as the cat family, for example, uh, and the dog family. And they represent different branches, different suborders of the carnivora. Um, and an interesting aspect of having two very well-known companion animals representing the two main branches is that genomic resources have been accumulating in the last two decades uh, for at least the two main branches of the carnivora. And in the last few years, additional genomic resources, such as VGP genomes, have been made available, such as a Canada lynx for the Philidae and an Eurasian otter for the Mustelidae. And several other good quality genomes have become available in the last few years. And they have been important for us to leverage this type of technology to understand the evolution uh, and conservation of these taxa. Most of my work has focused on the carnivora that occur in the new tropics, this biogeographic region that comprises South America, Central America, and into Mexico and Southern Florida. So this biogeographic region uh, includes the presence of these families highlighted in yellow here. Uh, and I've been studying them using various different approaches. Um, this is a comparative analysis of their divergence within the new tropics. So for each family here, these are only the terrestrial families highlighted, cat family, the dog family, the otter and weasel family, the skunk family and the raccoon and quadi family. We have a dated phylogeny uh, of these families. Uh, this is a divergence time scale. And in gray here, you see the timing of the closure of the Panamanian Isthmus when the Great American Biotic Interchange occurred. And there was a major exchange of fauna between South and North America. And many of these groups seem to have radiated in South America. For example, this genus of cats called the Leopardus genus, and this genus of foxes called the Lycalopex genus. Uh, not only did this genus probably radiate in South America, but the whole South American group of canids seems to have radiated in South America, as we'll see later on in the talk. So 
we clearly see contrasting patterns of diversification. Some of them have recently diversified, probably following the invasion of South America, while others, such as the raccoon family, have a very deep history, probably in Central and South America, of very ancient divergences. Others have had multiple invasions of South America. Dashed lines indicate lineages that are not occurring in South America or in the New Tropics. So they occur in other regions of the world. So here in the weasel and otter family, we see multiple invasions uh, of South America, whereas here you see autochthonous radiation here as well. So this provides us with an opportunity to investigate recent speciation processes, for example, in these taxa, to test species delimitation criteria, to investigate adaptive evolution, uh, we've discovered, for example, two hybrid zones, one hybrid zone in this group and one hybrid zone in this group. Uh, so we're studying these hybrid zones now with genomic approaches. There are several species of and populations of conservation concern. So we're addressing several of these aspects using our studies. And we're more and more using genomic approaches to target these problems. First time we used uh, genomic approaches uh, with this group, with this group of animals was when we developed the Jaguar Genome Project in 2011. So this grew as a consortium of Brazilian institutions uh, and ended up including collaborators from seven other countries. Um, and this led us to sequence the Jaguar genome. So this was the first Brazilian mammal to have its uh, genome sequenced. It was published um, in 2017 uh, in this study in which we also sequenced the genome of a leopard. This was an important collaboration with the Bill Murphy's group in Texas and several other collaborators from other countries. Uh, so we looked at the Jaguar genome in several respects uh, and compared it to the other big cats and, for example, dissected the phylogeny of the Panthera genus, the big cat. So the five current species, extant species of big cats using a domestic cat as an outgroup. So this figure indicates the most prevalent phylogeny in the genome. So this phylogeny, for example, United Lion and Leopard is the most common phylogeny in the genome, but we found pervasive evidence of genealogical discordance. Uh, at this bottom figure here, you see the whole genome aligned. And in blue, you see 500 KB windows in which this phylogeny is reconstructed. But then in red, you see other phylogenies reconstructed. There are 105 possible phylogenies for five species when they're rooted and all 105 are present in the genome. So there's pervasive genealogical discordance. And it was interesting to observe this pattern in which there seemed to be a trend for distal regions of chromosomes, the chromosomes, the domestic cat chromosomes onto which they were mapped. They're shown here at the bottom as these blue bars. Distal regions of chromosomes have an enrichment for the most prevalent phylogeny, whereas central regions and the proximal regions uh, have an enrichment for the other phylogenies. So this led us to study this phenomenon of hybridization and introgression among species of Panthera. This is another figure from that paper in which we use these statistics to look at historical uh, incidences of uh, hybridization among these species. And we found many of them. And we continue to find them as we look at this further. And I'm not going to go into this in much detail. So this has led us to continue studying this phenomenon uh, using genomes from other cat species. And this is an example of a study we did, again, in collaboration with Bill Murphy's group looking at complete genomes of 27 felid species. Uh, I just lost the pointer. Um, and here we're just looking at the Panthera genus, and we've done this for other genera in the Philidae, in which we compare the frequency of the most common phylogeny, the most common topology, for example, here, uniting lion and leopard. The second option, the most, second most common is uniting um, lion and jaguar, and the third unites uh, leopard and jaguar. And you compare its frequency in regions of the autosomes and X chromosome with low recombination and high recombination. And we see that this phylogeny is prevalent in regions of low and high recombination of the autosome, if you look at this broad scale, uh, and also high recombination on the X, but second topology is enriched in regions of low recombination on the X. Uh, and here you see a, a zoom in on the X chromosome, which you see a relationship of recombination rate and the prevalence of topology one, the most common one, in regions of low recombination, you see enrichment of other topologies, including topology two. If you look across the genome in windows uh, of uh, percentiles of recombination rate, you see clearly an increase of topology one in regions of high recombination and a decrease of topology two, both on the autosomes and the X. And we see this in other lineages of the cat family as well. So, this seems to be an interesting phenomenon in which when there is historical hybridization, there is a differential retention 
of different topologies in regions of high versus low recombination. And Bill, Bill's group especially is looking into this in more detail, and we are also interested in investigating this in other cat species and other carnivores. Another study in which we looked at genomics of uh, American or neotropical, but including in this case, the Arctic species was the puma. This was a collaboration with Beth Shapiro's group in which we sequenced two Brazilian pumas and compared them to North American pumas. And we looked at aspects such as historical demography with the TSMC analysis, for example, in which we looked at the trajectory of several North American pumas, compared them with two Brazilian pumas, and we see some differences that seem to uh, indicate that the history, the demographic history of South American and North American pumas were quite different, with not, uh, North American pumas having been derived from a recent recolonization event and having had a, a more pronounced decline in population size over time. Here you see a plot of heterozygosity versus uh, the proportion of the genome in runs of homozygosity. And you see a sharp distinction between the two Brazilian pumas with more diversity and fewer runs of homozygosity versus, for example, the Florida pumas. Those Florida pumas have very low heterozygosity and they're known to be an inbred population. This is prior to the reintroduction event that augmented genetic diversity in this population. And they have a large proportion of their genomes uh, harbored in runs of homozygosity. So these earlier studies uh, have been followed up by more recent studies, um, which have led us to now uh, have uh, data on a variety of neotropical carnivores. For example, we now have genomes on all 12 neotropical felids, including jaguars, for which we have 48 individuals sequenced, all neotropical canids, I'm gonna talk about that, over 240 genomes of small neotropical felids, and all the world's otters, including the four neotropical species. Um, for a study on this uh, aspect of having a lot of genomes from small cats, I'm just going to show you a slide from my student, Fernanda Trindade. She's speaking today. I don't know if it's before or after this session, but check out her talk uh, on this study on you know, a large number of low coverage genomes to investigate a hybrid zone that occurs between two neotropical species. This is the range of one species and the other, and we are looking at the hybrid zone that occurs here in southern Brazil. So do check out her talk to know more about this project. Going back to this slide, I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on these studies here that have come out in the last few months. Uh, one focused on jaguars, one focused on otters, another on small cats, and another on canids. So first, the Jaguar study that came out earlier, we looked at genomics of 13 Jaguar individuals, mostly from Brazil, but one from Guatemala and one from Arizona in the US. So we looked at levels of diversity and patterns of historical demography. One interesting result is to see how uh, congruent their PSMC trajectories are, indicating very high levels of connectivity in historical times. Uh, in Jaguar populations, which corroborates what we've been finding over the last 20 years with traditional markers. But an interesting aspect was that the two Central American and North American species here, they seem to have had a sharper decline in recent times, which we assume has uh, derived from their colonization of this peripheral area of their distribution. When we looked at uh, runs of homozygosity, uh, and here's the sum length of runs of homozygosity, the number of homozygosity, and we do a plot like that, uh, several aspects are interesting to address, but the most salient one are these two individual from two individuals from the Brazilian Atlantic forest. They have very large runs of homozygosity, and we're seeing that with other jaguars now from small fragmented populations. So they're skewed towards the right here, towards larger runs of homozygosity, indicating a recent history of inbreeding. So this is a very topical conservation-oriented area in which we're focusing more attention now. And this was started in this study and we're following up with other studies recently that I'm not going to talk about today. Moving into this other study that came out recently, uh, we sequenced the genome of the Margay, which is the small cat that has very large eyes and is very arboreal, the most arboreal of the neotropical cats, and an additional genome from a wild-caught ocelot. We already had a captive uh, bred ocelot, so now we had a wild one. We compared their genomes. The idea was to look at signatures of selection between these two sister species and compare their levels of genetic diversity and demographic history. This was led by Jorge Ramirez, a young Peruvian study student who's now back in Peru uh, and collaborated with us uh, in conjunction with several other uh, uh, collaborators, uh, including Pedro Galetti in Brazil. He was a postdoc in Pedro's lab while we were doing this study. 
uh, we mapped those new genomes against the VGP genome of the Canada lynx. So this shows a use of uh, one of these chromosomal level filet genomes that have become available. And that was part of our study. We measured levels of diversity and an interesting aspect was to see that the ocelot has consistently high levels of diversity. This is autosomal heterozygosity. Uh, it has uh, a large range. This is the range uh, of the ocelot. Uh, it has had a uh, large effective size. These are PSMC plots showing that the ocelot has uh, consistently larger effective sizes than the other species. Uh, it has a generalist ecology and it seems to be more denser, has higher uh, demographic densities than other species. Um, and this is an interesting aspect for us to pursue further. I'm gonna mention this at the end of the talk again. Uh, another species which had an interesting result was the Northeastern Tigrina, which had very low diversity. This is shown in, in orange here compared to Patagonian species or Southern South American species, the Joffrey's cat. And we believe this actually comprises a species con, uh, complex. Uh, and this uh, result probably pertains only to the Northeastern part of the range here, which is also something we're continuing to pursue. A pretty striking result was this comparison between a grassland adapted species, the Pampas cat and the arboreal forest dwelling species, the Margay. We saw shifts cyclical shifts that probably have to do with glacial interglacial cycles in which one species is going up when the other is down and vice versa, three or even four times, which was an interesting observation when you compare the ranges and their adaptations. Uh, it looks like they have uh, reciprocal trends, so opposite trends as glacial cycles induce forests to expand when in the interglacials and grasslands to expand during glacial cycles. So this was an interesting observation as well. Another result uh, was to find positive selection in a gene associated with eye development and function in the margay. So this has very large bulging eyes. These are the orbits, which are quite large in this species. So this was found using the whole genomes and then confirmed by PCR uh, in uh, Sanger sequencing of um, several 16 different margay individuals from South America. So this seems to be an interesting uh, indication of adaptive evolution in this species towards a nocturnal habit in arboreal lifestyle. Moving on to a, another study, this was led uh, by Daniel Chavez, an Ecuadorian young student uh, who worked with Bob Wayne. He did his PhD with Bob Wayne at UCLA, and this was a collaboration with many other uh, friends and colleagues. Our original idea was to look at adaptive divergence between the main wolf, this is the largest South American canid, and the bush dog, which is a small short legged species. And we, Bob's group uh, earlier had found that they are sister species and our phylogenists have corroborated this as well. So these are the most disparate sister species in the dog family. And we looked at this from a variety of aspects. It started as a project to look at these two and it grew to include genomes from all 10 species of South American canids. I'm just gonna go through it a bit quickly, but the paper is out now. You guys can take a look at it uh, in more detail. So Daniel did a lot of different analyses and the other collaborators as well, including phylogenetic reconstruction, biogeography analysis. For example, here we reconstruct the phylogeny uh, of all South American uh, canids. Um, this is the, these are the range maps for the different species. Um, we reconstructed most of their early divergences occurred east of the Andes. So this is a biogeographic analysis, which E means east of the Andes. So most of their original diversification occurred on the east. And then we see a group of small fox species that have crossed the Andes on their southern end and then diversified on the west side. Uh, this was an analysis run by Elan Granal uh, using GFOX, uh, in which we reconstruct the demographic history and divergence uh, profile and interspecies admixture among these species. So you see the effective sizes of ancestral branches as the width of these lines here. And the arrows, the purple arrows or the bar here, indicate ancient admixture among these species. So this result here is quite interesting. If you compensate for incomplete lineage sorting and hybridization, you get a very young date for the divergence of the South American canids around here, less than 3.5 million years ago, which indicates that the whole radiation may have taken place in South America after the Great American Biotic Interchange. Here you see the two sister species, bush dog and main wolf. Here you see a radiation of smaller fox-like species with lots of hybridization within this group. 
Here's a plot of uh, admixture. I'm just going to highlight one or two points here. There are lots of admixture inferred from these genomes among these the species, especially the foxes. For example, here between the pampas fox, this species here, and the South American gray fox, which have been considered conspecific based on some morphological analysis, but not using mitochondrial DNA analysis. There's a lot of admixture that we detect between these species here. And we have been identifying in Brazil another admixture process between the pampas fox and the hoary fox. Uh, uh, and these were the purest individuals we had. Uh, and still we have quite a bit of uh, ancient introgression identified between them. So this is a very interesting group to, fo to follow up using additional sampling. We measured genetic diversity. And these are plots of heterozygosity along the genomes of these species. So the fox species have very high diversity. The chromosomes are these intercalating lines. Bush dog, uh, maned wolf, and the short-eared dog have very low diversity. And Darwin's fox, which is an endemic from Southern South America, has long runs of uh, homozygosity. And these are two different populations with different demographic history. And here you see a plot comparing their genetic diversity with the runs of homozygosity. And you see a trend, a concerning trend for these uh, Darwin's fox from Southern Chile to have low diversity and lots of runs of homozygosity. And I'm gonna get back to this at the end. I'm um, just gonna use this slide to quickly go through the PSNC plots. I'm not gonna show details on all of them. So these analyses separate the Eastern canids from the Western canids. You see small fox species with larger effective sizes and trajectories maintaining large sizes. Here you can see an interesting case with multiple maned wolves and bush dogs. So the bush dogs in blue and the maned wolves in orange. Maned wolves are savanna-like habitat specialists, grassland specialists, and these are forest specialists. And you see a time when these maintain or even increase their size, which seems to coincide with the glacial maximum in which the savannas expanded and the forest contracted. This is another forest specialist. Uh, so the forest one seems to decline and the savanna one seems to increase. Um, here you see a decline of the Darwin's fox uh, demographic trajectory, uh, probably related to uh, glacial cycles as well in southern South America. There were interesting results uh, regarding signatures of selection. For example, here there were several genes uh, with signatures of positive selection, the main wolf, that are involved in a pathway related to uh, fruit fiber consumption and uh, butanoate metabolism which uh, we infer has to do with the main wolf adaptation to ingest fruit. So about half of its diet in some regions is based on fruit. Uh, we also found signatures of divergent selection uh, in the main wolf and bush dog in genes related to limb development, especially limb elongation. So this has long legs and this has short legs. So this was an interesting development of the study as well. Moving on to uh, the third study, uh, this was led by Vera de Ferran, a PhD student here that I co-advised with Klaus Kipfli. So this was a great collaboration with Klaus's group. Uh, it just made a cover of current biology. So we're happy about that. It included 24 genomes. Uh, 14 of them were novel sequenced for this study. Two of them sequenced from museum specimens in Tom Gilbert's lab. Um, so we studied several aspects of the evolution of these otters. Um, this is just a map showing their sampling. So we sampled all 13 currently recognized otter species from all these different continents. They occur in all continents except Australasia. Uh, we mapped the reeds against the uh, different uh, reference genomes, including the domestic ferret for the phylogenomics, since it's equidistant from all the others, but also the chromosome level VGP genome from a Eurasian otter. So that's another example of a use of a VGP genome uh, for uh, our studies. So we looked at phylogenetic relationships among these otter species, and we identified three major clades, which we label here clades one, two, and three. Here's a single species, the giant otter from South America, which diverged from the others about 10 million years ago. This is a neotropic or American clade, because we have the North American Lontrocanadensis, and these three are neotropical species, and they diversified about 3.7 million years ago. And this is an old world clade, uh, paleotropical and paleoarctic clade, including species from Africa and Asia. Uh, so we looked at their um, sequence of divergences, uh, signatures of uh, ancient introgression, which in this case, there were very few. Otters are very different from canids and philids that we looked at so far. Canids and philids have lots of interspecies introgression that we pick up with a variety of tests, whereas otters seem not to be so. 
which is intriguing. And we have speculated that it may have to do with the trend of otters to speciate allopatrically and to remain allopatric for a long time, possibly also uh, related to their semi-aquatic lifestyle, uh, re uh, restricted to streams and lakes or coastlines, uh, which may facilitate allopatry and make it more difficult for them to get in contact soon after speciation. There were some other uh, inference that we made that have uh, conservation implications. For example, we recognize Aeonyx congicus here, this species from the Congo Basin in Central Africa, uh, for which for the first time we had nuclear data on as a separate species from uh, the broader, the more broadly distributed Aeonyx capensis. So they diverged about 400,000 years ago. So this highlights the distinctiveness of this species and the need for it to have attention in terms of conservation planning and action. Now we made some other taxonomic propositions, for example, to unite all these species into a single genus, genus Lutra, and other biogeographic uh, inferences made on, on the basis of this result phylogeny. We looked at levels of diversity. So here we have heterozygosity genome-wide and the presence of runs of homozygosity of different sizes. So a few salient aspects, these two are zoo animals, so they may have a zoo in breeding, so we don't interpret that very closely. But these were wild caught animals, and both of them are from southern South America. And in particular, the one that made the cover, Lontra provocax, is an endemic of southern South America. And I was just talking about the fox, which is an endemic southern South American species. So this comes back to that region. Both of these are from uh, the western coast of South America here, in Pacific Coast, and this is inland, but still Southern South America. And they have low levels of diversity. They're both classified by IUCN as endangered, and they both have lots of runs of homozygosity. We also looked at the distribution of S and V density across the genome. So each plot here is a chromosome, and this is the species with the most diversity, also South American species, Lontra longicaudis, but broadly distributed across South America. And this is this species, Lontra provocax, with very low counts of SMVs across the genome. So this is a striking contrast of uh, genetic diversity in this group. We also looked at PSMC plots for multiple individuals when you had them for each species or one individual, uh, comparing trends uh, across continents, across regions, uh, and across time. Uh, in most cases, we saw increases followed by decreases of different magnitudes. So this decrease seems to be common, although not necessarily synchronous. And these uh, were estimated using as precise as possible generation times uh, so that we correct and we try to get to a comparable temporal scale. Uh, but this trend of going up and down seems to be consistent. There was an interesting case here with the Lutra Lutra from the UK with the Eurasian otter with a distinct trajectory here in earlier times. And we explored this in detail in our study, trying to infer what happened to it in terms of possibly a different demographic unit being present in Western Europe relative to Russia and Norway, which, is, which are these two individuals with the higher trajectory. But an interesting case, again, was this uh, otter here, this otter from Southern South America. And here's its range map. This is where it occurs. So it's an endemic of this species. And this had very low effective size. If you check out the y-axis, you see that its effective size is very low. Its coalescence is very recent, indicating a, very, a history of recent declines um, in Southern South America. The other one, Lontrophilina, also has a pretty sharp decline, a different trajectory, but also very low effective size. But the most striking case was this one of Lontroprovocus. And this leads me to connect it to another study performed by Jonas Lescourt. This is a Belgian student that I co-advise uh, at our university uh, jointly with the University of Antwerp with Hannes Svardal. Uh, and he's looking at the Leopardus genus, that diverse cat genus that uh, speciated in South America, probably radiated in South America after the invasion of a single ancestor. So we now have complete genomes from all the species. And this is just a plot showing genetic diversity, like we've shown before. So the ocelot, again, has high diversity. The northeastern Brazilian tigrina has low diversity. But now I'm highlighting the cod cod, or guinea, which is this species that is endemic to southern South America as well, that same region, a very similar region to the one that I was talking about when I was looking at the otter. So the guinea has very low diversity and also a history of demographic declines that we're inferring. So this. Um, 
jointly leads us to look at this comparison. When this is my last slide, so I'm just going to draw a comparison from three different studies, which is an interesting thing we can do now that we have genomic data from multiple species that diversified simultaneously after the invasion of South America. So we're now able to start doing these comparative analysis. So here you see the range maps from IUCN uh, for the cat, for the fox, very restricted range here, and for the otter. And all of them have very low diversity uh, and uh, inferences of demographic declines. And this type of comparison opens up new prospects for in-depth genomic studies targeting each of these species and their related species, looking at population level processes, trying to date and understand their declines in terms of the causal effects, whether these are natural processes induced, for example, by glacial cycles, or whether they have been exacerbated by human activities more recently. Um, so there are plenty of questions for us to address, and it's an exciting time to be generating and analyzing these uh, genomic data sets for these South American carnivores and other carnivores worldwide. I'd just like to finish by thanking uh, my collaborators. Um, most of them were highlighted when I showed the front page of the studies, but these are collaborators in these studies. Uh, and I thank them for their collaboration and their help and their leadership in several of these projects. Um, these are my students and postdocs who have uh, driven these studies uh, across the years, both using uh, traditional markers, but mostly using genomic markers these days. These are supporters, um, uh, NGOs and institutional support, funders that have made these studies possible. So I thank you and I'll be open for questions shortly.